Hello, hello. Yes, welcome to the talk, Shall We Play a Game? I am Wolf Gorlick. I'm GW Gorlick on Twitter. You know, of course, when I was coming up with this, some of you guys may recognize the reference, right, from, from War Games? Like, yeah, the, the classic movie, like Sneakers, War Games, and Tron. That was the trifecta of my generation that launched so much of us on the Commodores and TI-99 uh, and all the great old kit. And it had that great line, right? Shall we play a game? And I love that that line, I love that thought. And now, as I'm one of the gray beards in the industry, I oftentimes reach out to friends, younger friends, you know, and say, hey, what do you think about this talk? What do you think about this topic? And they're like, yeah, that's so cutting edge. It's so not like you, right? Saw. I'm like, saw? And they're like, yeah, don't you mean like, do you want to play a game? You had the name wrong, but I love the concept. I'm like, no, not saw. I'm like, no, no, I mean like, how about a nice game of chess? And they're like, what about like, how much blood will you give in order to survive? I'm like, what is wrong with you? So in case you guys are curious, you know, I, I love my friends, I love the younger folks, I love my avocado toast, but millennials are truly ruining everything, including talk titles. Because I can't make 80-year-old references anymore. But no, the, the concept of war games was very fascinating to me. That, that rinse and repeat. What do you do when things happen? What do you do when things are about to, to go wrong and how do you prepare your team and prepare your folks. I've been playing with this for many, many years. When I was a security officer for our financial services firm, we started off with a series of lunch and learns where I would go, scary thing in the news. And my team would go, oh my God, we can't protect it. And I'd go, well, what if we could? And they're like, well, we need money. I go, what if you have no money? And they're like, why do you do this to us? I'm like, we can do this. Let's think about it. Let's think about the tools we have at hand. And over time, we got a little bit better, got a little bit faster, and now today I do consulting, uh, and oftentimes I will lead exercises uh, quarterly or semi-annually or sometimes annually. Please don't do annual exercises. You do it, you forget it. But I'll, I'll do these exercises, and I'll be like, all right, here's the scenario, here's what's going on, go. Who sees what? And the IT guy goes, I see this over here. I'm like, awesome, what about the help desk? Not this guy's, I don't know, I get a whole bunch of calls. I'm like, great, so how do you guys talk? So we do these sort of things. And, and build up strength. So today I'm gonna to share with you guys some of the things we've learned about what makes for a good exercise, how to keep score, how to mature it, and I'm gonna end on a simple maturity model that you can follow if you wanna implement these type of exercises in your own environment. So, starts off, problem statement, you guys all know this, we already raised the hands, people who were in instant response. We have a, a life cycle of IR, right? It looks like this. We get ready, we see the bad guys, we contain the bad guys, we recover, we learn. We all know this. It's in every textbook ever. Um, criminals, of course, have their own life cycle. It could be a kill chain, if you want to call it that. It could be an attack path. Shout out to my friends in the Michigan security community who use that model. Whatever it is, there too are following a defined set of steps. What's important is time. Who can do your life cycle faster, right? And in instant response, we hear all the time, oh, it takes six months to identify a breach. You know, Verizon said 200 days, or 250, or 270, and this other threat report said 300. Like, oh, okay, long time before we can even detect it. Response takes, on average, three months. You're like, what do you mean, three months? You found the breach, it took you three months to do anything about it, what are you doing? And we're like, yeah, but we found it, but we didn't know, should we like image it, should we do this? I have, uh, I have one organization I work with that was fighting a Petya not Petya for close to six months because they think it was done and it'll pop up over here, and they think it was gone and pop up again. Months, these things can go on for. Meanwhile, our criminals move through this chain oftentimes very, very quickly. Depending on how noisy they want to be or not, they can be doing anywhere from a week to months to doing an initial recon. Um, initial breach, days, right? Elevate privileges, minutes, maybe days. Um, lateral, hours. Uh, persistence, days to weeks, again, depending on how noisy they want and how big the payload it is. So if you think back to that quintessential security model, right? How long it takes you to protect something, as long as that time is quicker than it takes you to detect and respond, right? Someone's breaking in, alarms go off, and you get there before they can break in and steal stuff, you're secure. If there's a fire going on and it's rated, your safe is rated for six hours, and it burns for three hours, you're secure. If that time exceeds the time it takes to protect, that's when we're in a bad spot. And you add that up, you see readily why we're in a bad spot. Criminals can move through our environment in about three months, and it takes us nine months before we do anything about it. That's the problem statement. That's what we're trying to solve. Because again and again and again, when we do this math, it's game over, right? 
Insert coins to continue, preferably to your IR retainer. So I don't like that. I don't like to lose. And I started playing games with my team to try and figure out how to speed it up. These games have to start somewhere. And as I mentioned, it started off in Lunch and Learns so where I sit down and I was like, let me tell you a story. What did I see in the news? What did I hear in Krebs? What's going on, right? Good IR scenarios, good IR games begin with that story. Sometimes the executives coming to us going, hey, guess what I heard about? Are we protected from that? And you're like, uh, yes, yes, we totally are. I'll get you details in a little bit. I'm going into a meeting, right? One of those things. Sometimes, hopefully, it's a little bit more proactive. Some source for those stories are those breach of the week. So that's probably the predominant source. Um, so many podcasts, so many news stories out there. Problem is, of course, they don't usually go into enough detail to actually build out a full threat model. But breach of the week's work. Another one is great is pen tests. Pen tests provide phenomenal stories. I'll give you an example. I was doing an assessment, sitting down with the client in a conference room, asking questions. Do you have this? Do you have that? What do you do about this? And he's like, Yeah, okay. All of a sudden, he gets a phone, and his other guy gets a phone there, looking at each other. We'll be right back. I'm like, wait, what's going on? We'll be right back. They run out of the room. And I knew my guys were doing a pen test. So I kind of knew it was, must be us. Like, I hope it's us. And Cecil comes back. I'm like, what happened? He's like, don't worry about it. I'm like, but I want to know what happened. Other guy comes back. I'm like, what happened? He's like, well, let me tell you what happened. I'm like, yes. I should not have asked the Cecil. So I pulled him aside. I'm like, what, what, what goes on? He goes, well, you know that fishing test you're running? I go, yeah. The one where we're like, you know, saying, hey, by the way, you should log in to your HR portal and tell us how much PTL. He goes, yeah, that one. He goes, so the funny thing happened. The CEO was writing his quarterly update. I'm like, yes. And he saw that, uh-huh. And he remembered something about the HR team doing something about benefits. And he put it on the top of his email. You should really do this right now. And everybody's been clicking on it. We've now lost like 95% of our credentials. Like, yeah, well, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But that's a good story though, right? When you're threat modeling, it's a great time to go, hey, remember what that happened in the pen test? That was bad. But have you thought about what happens when people social engineer executives? It's a great starting point. Threat and tell is another place that's good. Much like breach of the week, breach of the week tends to be very high level. So-and-so got breached. Wendy's paid $50 million. She's like, oh, wow, that's bad. What do they do? Someone sold credit cards. Wendy's paid $50 million. Okay, but what was the breach? $50 million, like, ah. Threat and tell is like the exact opposite. 110, 50, 17, 14. What is that? That's an IP address. But what happened with it? I don't know. Did they, did they lose money? 110, 50, come on, guys. So threat and tell is actually like the opposite problem. Um, instant response is a great one because it always looks like that, doesn't it? No, but things go wrong, and that gives you a good story. You know, you come back in, they're like, oh, man, last week we got hit with this incident. Here's what happened. We want to do a threat model. We want to tear it apart, do lessons learned. Awesome sources for these stories. We take these stories, and then we tell them out. And I say a good story has three main points. It has a heart. It's interesting. It's funny. You hear it, and you want to go, that's a good story. I'm going to tell someone else that, which is vital in uh, organization because you want that message to spread, right? Uh, it has a point. You, what's the point out of that? Well, um, the point with the executive and the HR, it was executives are getting fished. They're targets. And when they get hit, there's a bigger ramification. Okay, good. And point three is it has data. It's supported by facts. So what about executives? I don't care. Yeah, I know, but it happened to us at one off. But do you know, like, a third of the time right now, executives are the primary target. And you're like, oh, wait, really? Yeah, there's this statistic in Verizon data reach report or crowd circuit, blah, 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 blah. You know, you get the idea. Heart point data. Good stories. Good stories that we can build things on. Caution. Don't create FUD. So much of our industry grew up on Tron and war games, and then we want to scare people because they won't listen to us because they don't want to be scared. They're just building IT, and oh my God, don't you realize what the bad guys can do? And we did that in the 90s, and then we're like, okay, good. We'll scare them, and then they'll be scared straight. And it's like, yeah, do you remember like the Your Brain on Drugs commercials? Did that work for our generation? I just wanted an egg sandwich after that. No, no, no. So don't create FUD. This is not about scaring the users. It is about informing them. It is about educating them. I do want to see what my GIF looks like in the big screen. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Okay. I was very curious about that. All right. Moving forward. Another thing is, 
is that any objections you face, and you will face objections when telling stories, are actually really key data points. And they're really key data points because it allows you to learn something interesting. I'll give you an example. I was doing one of these exercises, and it was on System Center. And if anyone has seen Dave Kennedy's talk uh, when he breached System Center, it was awesome. He hit the keys, and he lights up the slider, and he's going like this, and shells are popping. He gets like thousands of shells in minutes, and everyone goes, yeah, it's like a rock star, right? And I was so pumped. I'm like, guys, we need to do this. And so I'm on the table, uh, in the conference room, at the table, talking about this. And the director of security pushes herself away, and she folds her arm. She goes, that would never happen here. I'm like, you guys are putting in systems there. She goes, yeah, it doesn't matter. So my, my gut instinct is, well, she didn't like my story, so forget her. But no, I was like, oh, this is a good example, good teachable moment. I'm like, yeah, you're right. You know, that probably won't happen here. So there's this thing called Google dorking. And she's like, what is that? And I go, yeah, it's, a, it's a dorky name. Don't worry about it. But you Google things like System Center, your company name. And I do it, and we're on the projector, and it pops up. And she goes, oh, that's interesting. Go, yeah, so the first link is LinkedIn, where your guys are like, hey, I now know a System Center. Go, okay, that's bad. Yeah, so there's your targets. Your second link is a guy going, hey, I'm trying to implement System Center. There's this problem, and here's why it's not working. So there's your targets, and there's your source of information on what you, you know, craft for a fish. She's like, oh, okay. But the third link, the third link was my favorite, case study with a quote from her on Microsoft's page about how great System Center is. Like, I think they know you have System Center. And so she pulls herself back to the table, doesn't even acknowledge she's wrong. She points to her people and goes, see, see, this is why we bring them in. You guys need to listen. And they're like, teachable moment though, right? Teachable moments, teachable moments. All right, next thing that happens, once you have a good story, and this is something that bothered me for years, is what are their tactics? If you're not a red team or if you're on defense, it's very difficult to get outside of your world and see what those tactics are, right? It's very difficult to go from that 50 million Wendy story to actual breach tactics. Um, so how can we do that? And if you think about it, there's really a trifecta of a good exercise. Tactics, the controls you have, and how we exercise it. So I'm going to start with tactics. Um, you can build a scenario around a story, right? That attack life cycle begins to have a story. If it's something like a common data breach, you're like, yeah, well, you know we have this health information. Like, yeah, we do. And do you know employees are downloading it? Well, they shouldn't, but they are. And they're putting it on their computer, so that's bad. I know. And do you know the number one breach in the OCR? What's the number of breach in the OCR? Stolen laptops. They're like, we're going to stop that person. Like, we do. And that becomes your first threat model, right? A very simple high-level scenario. Similarly, you can tell the exact same story. You know, we store the health information. I know. And criminals are uh, phishing DB. They are? Absolutely. They'll fish a database administrator. And when he's not there, he'll go and they'll steal the creds. Like, that's terrible. I go, I know. Like, does that happen? I go, have you heard of Anthem? I'm like, oh, really? And now you've got a story. Now you've got a scenario. So that's a good start. You can start breaking out those stories into individual data points. Finally, with the MITRE attack framework, this has become so much easier. Because heretofore, when we do threat models or we do scenarios, we'd have no way of tying it back to a common framework. When the IR team would find things, they'd have no way to tie it back to a common framework. When our pen testers would come in and pen test, they well, oh, you got this problem, that problem. Okay, that's great. But what are the tactics we need to defend against? Or, I don't know. The ones that we reported on. No way to tie it back to a common framework. With the MITRE attack framework, we now can say our threat intel team sees this. Our pen testers see this. Our IR folks have seen this. Here's the common tactics we're seeing, and oh, by the way, here's a story that supports them. Really powerful stuff. It looks something like this, in the world's largest Excel file. For those of you doing, this is really cool to me. I love Excel. It's huge and beautiful. All right. <laughs> so when we do these, we'll do them with Excel. And we'll start over here. Here's our attack lifecycle, right? This is right from attack, uh, the attack framework. Here's the steps the criminals are taking. The next row is the individual tactics they'll use, and then we personalize it for the individual example. For those of you guys, you probably recognize this is Petya, not Petya, moving through an environment. So we can say, you know, privilege escalation, what does that look like? Well, they're going to have to valid accounts. So what would that look like? Well, that would look like the malware attempting to log into dormant accounts or disabled accounts because they're on the box. Do you have a, do you have an alert for that? Do you, can you respond to that, right? We can build out that scenario and do very granular, step-by-step, line-by-line descriptions of what the criminals do. And then, as I mentioned, great stories have heart, they have a point, they're supported by data. We can say, how frequent is this happening? Some uh, threat reports are now giving heat maps 
of MITRE and giving real world data of MITRE and some of the threat intel feeds have MITRE linked to it. So you can say, yeah, and by the way, that tactic we just talked about is now responsible for 40% of the breaches over the last quarter. You're like, wow, really? Yes. So if we could stop that, we'd be in a really good spot. We can start using threat intelligence in a more uh, smart way. But caution here, when you do that, you gotta be careful not to be too specific. And the system center example worked with that customer with system center. If they don't have system center, if they have service now, you wouldn't have worked at all. It would have been, that would never happen to us and be like, let me Google you and system center. I'm like, oh, we're at service now shop. I'm like, oh, no. But isn't it still valuable to ask what would happen if the criminals got a hold of service center? Or service now, rather? I can bet you it wouldn't be good if they got a hold of service now. I've seen what happens when criminals get a hold of VMware consoles. Ooh, that's bad. So we don't want to be too uh, specific. We want to elevate at one level. Saw the same thing when Target happened. I saw a whole bunch of smug people going, we would never let our HVAC vendors into our network. Like, really? Yeah, never. What about other third-party supports? Never on HVAC. <laughs> Do you have a managed IT provider? Maybe. Are they running Bobgar? Uh-huh. Do you have multi-factor authentication? They don't touch HVAC, right? We don't want to have it so focused. We have to pull it up. Same thing with Equifax. I loved all my friends in the Microsoft world who went, ha, see? See, Apache and Struts, if you're running .NET, won't have happened. Like, really, you guys never have whole days in your code? I mean, IS never has a problem, really? So taking it up that one level, looking at things like third-party vendors or service management or your web apps allows you to create a, a model that's a little bit more broad, a little more um, able to catch more criminal activity. Once we have these, we can then do the tabletops. Tabletops are so much fun. Tabletops here, I mean specifically IT tabletops. IT tabletops with your subject matter experts. I do not mean, um, and we've, I've done these, I do not mean let's get in HR, um, let's get in you know, your corporate counsel. I mean let's get in all the smart folks who are actually running the IR exercise. Hands on keyboards, eyes on glass, boots on the ground. Let's get them in the room and talk through it. One of the things that's very interesting is to do what I'm about to talk about and then use that as the inject for a larger tabletop conversation. We did this with the law firm. They sent out the representative from their legal counsel. They sent out a representative from their IR retainer and their PR retainer. We all got in a room and I'm like, your IT guys just said this, what do you do? And that was a great conversation. But what I'm talking about here is more technical, right? What's Petya not Petya doing in the network and scanning and, and whatnot. So we take a tabletop and we get people in the room. Why? Because we wanna make sure that we share the story and scenario. We wanna make sure that we educate participants on the IR life cycle. That's number one. Get them to run through that IR life cycle again and again and again. Also why it's important to have an interesting story. So they'll stay and pay attention. Maybe make some popcorn, have some good time with it. And we just say, hey, read the IR life, the report and sign off that you have reviewed the IR report quarterly. They will absolutely click that ticket every single time. They will absolutely not pay attention and be ready. So we wanna make sure that they've run through that. We also want to make sure we gain consensus on controls. I've been in so many environments where the help desk guy goes, oh, that's not my area. Network guy has it. Awesome. Network guy, what do you do? Oh, that's not my area. The server guy has it. Server guy, what do you do? We don't have anything. <sighs> gain consensus on controls. And of course, you're going to miss a whole bunch of controls. So build the use cases for why we need to invest and spend time and maybe buy technology to put in place new controls. Purposes for a tabletop. This is the control side of things. Obviously, we're looking at prevention detection back to you know, the time it takes to breach the prevention, the time it takes to do the detection. Those are my two favorite controls. There are times when people want to get more fancy. We want to talk about disruption. We want to talk about degradation. Deception technology is always sexy. We're going to put in honeypots. And blah, blah, blah. All that's cool. All that's great. But I'd argue at first stage, when you're starting off the tabletops, you start with prevention and detection. This allows us to get some very interesting metrics, simple metrics. People talk all the time about defense in depth. And I like, I like that idea. Yeah, sure, defense in depth, yeah, we need it. But against what? What are we really defending against? And what's our depth against? If we say defense in depth against the path an attacker is taking through the network, as evidenced and tracked by the MITRE uh, framework and you know, our controls on it, then we can have some interesting conversations about where we should add or remove. We just say we got lots of layers, so you know, okay, kudos, you got two sims, awesome. Three AVs, you're off the charts. Um, how would the bad guys get in this way? So you can put together some great metrics that way. If you think of this as a spreadsheet, we've got the tax stage, right, the tactics, 
These come from Attack Miter. We got the controls and the other descriptions. Those are what glues us together. And then a control framework. First one that comes from that story and the scenario threat modeling I talked about a minute ago. This is where we're focusing on the tabletop. Let's have this conversation, figure out what we really have. When we boil it all down, it looks like this. Now what's cool about this is, from the bottom and the top of these are frameworks, right? TAC and CIS controls in this example. It's that middle one, the description, that actually makes it work. It's the middle one that's the true story of what the criminal would do and what we would do. It's the middle that's our narrative and our meat. It's the middle that we can act on, those tactic descriptions and control descriptions. We can line it up to something high level like NIST or CS if you want. Of course, NIST is great for high-level people and your program, you're buying, you get support. And low level is great for technical people. What am I actually going to do? Uh, this then allows us to roll up in some pretty cool metrics as well along the framework. What, what do we have in place to stop initial access? What do we have in place for privilege and lateral movement? Exfiltration, we're terrible at. Where should we invest? Let's, let's catch the exfiltration, let's stop the initial access. We can have some good talks and conversations around where we need to be spending our time to improve things. And then we can actually emulate it, right? Run the game. You guys seen this in a makerspace or a maker fair, the, the life-size game of Mousetrap? If you haven't, you gotta see it. The ball starts and things go flying, it's following the track and it goes down the, and then there's a, and then a hammer falls on the car and go, ah, it's awesome, you gotta see it. But it's a great metaphor for what happens in these scenarios. We know the track the ball is gonna fall. Right? It's following that threat model we already laid out. The question is, will it actually make it down the bathtub? Will it actually make it in the bucket? Will the car get smashed? Will the right things happen to stop that ball from proceeding, or will it make it, right? Would an attacker be able to actually execute this path? This is the exercise portion of it. This is the adversarial portion. We take that threat model and we start breaking it out. Oh, you're doing AD uh, logging authentication? That's awesome. When was the last time you tried to log into a disabled account and did your SOC notice and report it to you? Oh, you're, you're protecting email boxes from you know, people proxying and using them? Fantastic. H have, you, have you tried that? Is there logging? Is the things enabled? These are specific IT tactics, right? We are doing this and specific tests. We're gonna test it this way to make sure the controls are ready. Very simple, very straightforward in a predefined path to make sure the assumptions are there. And so often they're not. A couple weeks ago, I was working with the organization, they had these 12 VIP systems. Very important, highly controlled, very rigorous, 12 of them, and one of the controls was network access. The cables were locked, right? The MAC addresses were set, the, everything was in place. And if anyone pulled that cable out or anyone plugged anything else in, Boom, the alarms went off, the mousetrap fell, the attacker was captured right there. Like, awesome, that's great. Let's test it. Uh, what? Let's test it. I thought we were just doing tabletop. Oh yeah, but tomorrow we're testing it. Uh, okay. One was fine. Five was fine, right? Eight was fine. Nine? No, no, we could plug anything we wanted in that one. Hmm, did the alert go off? No. Was the mouse trap? You know, you can just imagine my other kiosk go, there's no mouse trap. <laughs> it was great. And this is the type of thing you won't catch in a pen test. A pen test is going to go through the first uh, path in as quick as possible because that's what they should do. But when we do adversarial emulation, we're actually testing what our assumptions are. We think this will work. How oftentimes does it really work? See, without exercising the defense, we really truly have no assurances that it will work. And so that's where running down these spreadsheets and executing tests on each one of them becomes so absolutely important. Key warning here is create evidence, not incidents. I'm running out of time, so I won't tell you this story, but see me afterwards if you want. There's many times when you're executing these that you have the opportunity to perhaps cause some damage, so be very careful, obviously. Next thing we need to keep score. We need to keep score and know where we're at. I've already given you some ideas of how to keep score. What's our defense coverage, right? What's our, our defense in depth? Um, but if you're doing these regularly, and you should be, I would argue, at least quarterly, doing them again and again, you begin to see some interesting themes. And it can start off very simple with keeping score. Hey, how many have we held, right? How many were, did the people come together? That's a good metric when you're beginning. Uh, what is our scenario of defense in depth? That's a good metric. Are we getting better or worse? Um, what's our stage control coverage? That is, across that life cycle, across the attack MITRE framework, how many of those MITRE top levels are we actually fulfilling on, and what's our protection? 
pretty important metric, number and percentage. As you get more mature, you can start doing things like number of exercises held, control effectiveness, right? Of the 20 controls we said we had, how many of them actually were there, number and percentage? And then we get to the, the best one, which is time to detection. Time to detection is where you want to get to ultimately. Where you run these exercises, you know that the, the mousetrap is supposed to fall. You know the uh, Splunk dashboard is supposed to light up. You know the phone is supposed to start ringing. Did it. Okay, now that we know that it does and we can do it consistently, how fast and how quick did they find it? And by tuning that up, we get right to the heart of the problem we said in the beginning, which is how fast can we identify and detect and respond. So as we mature, that's where we want to head towards. We can also begin to uh, find some cool themes. So I love me some Sankey diagrams. So we can start looking at all the different tactics and where it lines up and what it controls have what stopping power and start looking at it that way. We can also begin, if we're lining up to controls, to look at the overall stopping power across the whole deadline or across the whole kill chain with things like our CS controls and lining them up to NIST. So we can start to see where we're strong and where if a criminal walked in, uh, for example, supply chain risk management, back to the whole target example, that they would just be able to walk across that whole line and not be caught. Very interesting things become possible when you start aggregating this data and you're doing multiple exercises. So, shall we play the game? That was the talk today, that was the theme. This is not, obviously, a matter of life and death, thankfully. Um, it's also not a matter of, you know, thermonuclear war or national secrets, thankfully. But it is a matter of making sure your team knows the IR life cycle, knows prevention, detection, and response, is well practiced and well exercised in that, such that when it happens, help desk knows how to talk to the IT guys and the administrators know how to talk to the network guys, and everyone's feeding into the, the InfoSec instant handler, and the communication is going up and across appropriately. And of course, making sure those exercises really do um, result in controls that really do exist and are effective. It's about learning how to respond faster and detect faster. So I promised you a uh, maturity model. Here it is. Starting out is that story, right? Story around the water cooler, story around lunchtime, very ad hoc. Here's what happened. What would we do? As you begin to mature, you can build out more of a formal process. Maybe we do it once a month or once a quarter. And we can start having tabletops, bring people together. All you need is a whiteboard, spreadsheet, PowerPoint, and uh, some breakfast. Did I mention breakfast? Pro tip, breakfast. Good food. Uh, as you start to mature further, we're going to take those scenarios and we're going to break them up into individual tactics and have more conversation about individual controls. So getting into that one level deeper. We're personalizing it to the actual story. As we become even more mature, we're gonna align those tactics and controls up to a framework, such as the TAC MITRE framework, or CS Critical Security Controls, or insert your control framework here. And we're gonna to begin to exercise these to make sure that our assumptions really do fit, right? We say that we can detect, can we really? We say that we prevent, is it really functioning? And then as we reach a highest level of maturity, we're doing those exercises We've added automation where we're automating those exercises and checking them on a regular basis. And of course, throughout this process, we've been adding metrics, how many tabletops are done and whatnot, so we can move into a stage of continuous maturity. That's a way to take from right now, doing nothing, all the way to where you could be in a year or two, building an entire program around this incident response exercise model. And of course, scoring points, because it's all about the points, especially when you can start gamifying it and getting people excited. Do we go faster than we did last time? Do we stop more than we did last time? Where are we at? Where are we going? We got people really competitive, especially when we break them into two different teams. Um, it's, a, it's a great sense to be really excited about where you're going, where you're doing. And ultimately, it's about making sure that when things really do happen, are people ready? They're comfortable, they're confident, they know how to communicate, they know how to get things done. That's it for me. I think I'm pretty much up on time. Here's my contact information if you want to hit me up with any questions. And uh, hey, enjoy the rest of the B-Sides.